book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be in chapter 2 this morning. This morning, pastor's continuing his sermon series in 1 Corinthians. This morning, with a sermon entitled, It's Still the Cross. It's Still the Cross. When you find your place in the Word of God, will you stand with me out of respect for the reading of the Word of God? Beginning in verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the word of God says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear, And in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for the cross. Lord, we pray as we come to the time of preaching, may your spirit move, may your spirit work, may your spirit cleanse us and renew us and mold us. May we be ready, may we be willing to change. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we will become more like your son this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. We are going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 2 this morning. Church, our theme for the year is what? Church matters. Let's try it one more time. Our theme for the year is what? Church matters. And it matters for a number of reasons. One of the reasons we're going to be considering as we go through this is because the world needs the church. Amen? Because another reason as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians is because the Christian needs the church. Amen? And so as we consider these thoughts... And we consider the reality that church matters. I do think we have to stop and remember that the world needs the church. Because the world needs to see the life of Christ. The world needs to hear of the love that Christ offered. Now let me ask you, if they're not going to hear it from the church, where are they going to hear it from? From the news? From social media? From Hollywood? From their favorite political candidate? No, the world needs the church. But what we're finding here in the book of 1 Corinthians is that if we are going to be the kind of church the world needs, then we have got to keep the things of this world, the fleshly things of this world, out of the church. We've likened it to the analogy of it is a wonderful thing for a ship to be in water. It is not a wonderful thing for water to be in the ship. And so we as a church need to be in the world, but there are things of this world that we need to keep out of the church. The world needs the church. But hear me, the church needs the Lord. And this whole thing of keeping the water out of the ship is a lot harder than it sounds when you initially say it. And Paul here is dealing with some problems in the church of Corinth. How many of us know that every church has problems? Yeah, every church has problems. Why is that the case? Because every church is made up of people. And people plus personalities always equal problems. I bring my problems, you bring your problems, and together we make up brand new problems. Amen? But Paul here is dealing with some problems at the church of Corinth. Now what I love, though, is that from what we've seen so far, he doesn't talk too much about the problems. And that's probably disappointed some of us. We want to hear more of the juicy details of all the dysfunction in this church. But Paul doesn't spend a lot of time delineating out all of the dysfunction. He addresses the division, but Paul has really spent two or three times as many verses focusing on the cross. Why is that? Why does Paul just address the division, but then he focuses on the cross? Why is that? Well, church, it's because the cross is still the answer. The cross is still the answer. Here's the thing. You cannot be a cross-centered church and be a clicky church. Can't do it. You cannot be a cross-centered church and be a carnal church. You cannot be a cross-centered church and be a critical church. 
or a self-centered church. The cross is the answer. What we're going to find here in chapter number 2 is that there is a wisdom and a power found in the cross that remains the answer for the lost and saved alike. Church, it's still the cross. Amen. Let's look at this chapter together, begin in verse number 1, and we'll start by reading through verse number 5. Paul writes, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I want us to see some things this morning about the cross. Number one, the cross declares a saving message. The cross declares a saving message. Paul points out the simplicity of this message. He said, when I came to you, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The word save there has the idea of, of but or, or no more than. And so Paul said, when I came, the only thing that I wanted to talk to you about was Jesus and him crucified. I'm going to tell you, there is a beauty in the simplicity of the gospel message. The gospel message is not about a political party. The gospel message is not about an economic status, it's not about ethnicity, it's not about any of these other things. The gospel message is about the love of God extended to sinful men. The gospel message we find later in this book, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3, where Paul wrote, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Or as John put it in his gospel that God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or as Paul put in his letter to the Romans, uh, Romans 10 beginning in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In John 1 and verse number 12 the Bible says, but as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Aren't you glad God doesn't take a credit check when you come to him? Aren't you glad God doesn't ask for a resume when you come to him? Aren't you glad that it's as simple as recognizing that I am a lost sinner before God, but that God loved me so much that since I couldn't come to him, he came to me. Since the wage of my sin was death, he died on a cross that I might have access to his life. And it is as simple as recognizing who I am as a sinner before a holy God. Recognizing who he is, the sinless son of God who came and took on flesh. Who died my death, paid a penalty he didn't know. If I recognize who I am and I recognize who he is and believe in my heart and what he's done, the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's a beauty in this simplicity because anybody can receive it. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, what you've done, what you haven't done. Anybody can receive it. By the way, too, there's a beauty in this simplicity because not only can anybody receive it, but anybody can relay it. Yeah, you don't have to have some grand and special gift to be able to turn around and tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. We all ought to be soul winners, amen? We all ought to be sowing the gospel seed into the places God has planted us. It is that simple. Come as a child 
It is that simple. Paul said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Not only is there a simplicity of this message, but there is a sufficiency of this message at all as well. In other words, Paul said, it doesn't need man to manufacture anything around it. it. This message doesn't need man to manipulate anyone to it. Paul said, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I didn't come with high words and high emotion. He said, in fact, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my physical manner, they were nothing to be impressed by. You see, the gospel message is enough. And the reality is, any man that attempts to add anything to the gospel message will do nothing but detract from it. The gospel message is sufficient for every heart. I love how uh, Acts chapter 16, it relays to us Paul's experience there in the city of Philippi. As he came there, he found a woman named Lydia. And Lydia had a ready heart. She was ready to receive God's word. And you know what we find? That the gospel message was sufficient for the ready heart. Then they get into the city and what do we find? We find this demon-possessed girl. Follow them around, tormenting them. And Paul turned around and rebuked that demon That young girl was delivered. You know what we find? We find the gospel message wasn't just good for a ready heart in Lydia. It was good for a sin-ravaged heart in that demon-possessed girl. And then we find they get thrown in jail. They get thrown in jail. But God sets them free, amen? If you remember that story, the Philippian jailer, boy, he he was worried. He was upset. He was ready to take his own life. Until Paul and Silas called out to him from the jail. And he turned to those men and said, what must I do to be saved? You see, the gospel message is sufficient for the ready heart. It's sufficient for the sin-ravaged heart. It's it's, it's sufficient for that rock-hard heart of of that jailer who'd, who'd probably seen too much and done too much. And yet the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that Christ died for our sins, that he buried, he rose again, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel message was sufficient even for him. I love it when we see kids come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. I love it when we see old people come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The gospel message is sufficient. And it doesn't need man to manufacture anything around it. It doesn't need man to manipulate anyone to it. No, God loves you. And he died for you. If you've never received, if you've never received that gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day that you do that. You know, church, we got to be careful. Sometimes we become so, it's almost like we want to sell the gospel like it's a used car. And we have these tips and tricks and these ways we try to get people to say the things we want them to say. It's not about that. The gospel doesn't need us to sell it like a used car. There's a simplicity of this message and it's beauty, beautiful in its simplicity. There is a sufficiency in this message. Paul said, I didn't need to manufacture. I didn't need to manipulate. You just needed to know Jesus. And there's a beauty in the sufficiency. But I'm going to tell you, there's also a strength in this message. Paul said in verse number 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In other words, our faith should not stand in the wisdom or skill of men, but in the power, the dynamic, miraculous strength of God. You know, why is that? Because men fail. I've known many a Christian who's who put a fair amount of faith in men. And the problem is those men fall. And when those men fall, what happens to our faith? It becomes shaken. 
And we become in danger of falling ourselves. Men fail. Men fall. God does not. God does not. And I'm going to tell you, it's still the cross that declares a saving message. We need the cross, amen? We need the cross. It's still the cross that declares a saving message, but it goes beyond that, church. Because Paul then tells us that it's still the cross and the wisdom of the cross that that helps to develop our spiritual maturity. Look what he says beginning in verse number 6. He says, How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, meaning mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the wisdom, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So not only does the cross declare a saving message, but the cross develops our, our spiritual maturity. And I'm going to tell you there's a simplicity here as well that's beautiful. The wisdom of the cross doesn't just teach us how to live forever. The wisdom of the cross teaches us how to live today. Church, we have to let that sink in. The wisdom of the cross doesn't just teach us how to live forever. The wisdom of the cross teaches us how to live today. Wisdom is skill in living. Wisdom is a mark of maturity. In verse number 6 when he says we speak wisdom unto them that are perfect. Perfect doesn't mean without error. It means full grown. It means complete. In other words, we can liken it back to the illustration of of physical development. The milk versus meat debate. If I were to put a filet mignon in front of my son Timothy, he would not appreciate it. He lacks the maturity to be able to receive the meat. All that boy wants is milk. But you know, that rings true in a spiritual sense as well. In fact, in the very next chapter, Paul's going to get into this a little bit. Let's take a preview from verse number 3. He looks at this, or chapter 3, he looks at this church and he says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. You see, the cross isn't just sufficient for our salvation. The cross is sufficient for our sanctification as well. In church, once we get saved, that's not the end. That's the beginning. Once we get saved, it's time to start growing in Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18, we're admonished to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul looks at this church in Corinth. He looks at this church here in Clyde, and he says, Christians, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. And the wisdom of Christ and the wisdom of the cross teach us how to live in this world. I think it's important to point out here, and Paul develops this in this section, that the wisdom of the cross is different from the wisdom of this world. They are not the same. 
Paul says, verse 6, not the wisdom of this world, not the wisdom of the princes of this world, but the wisdom of God. You know, James delineates that a little bit for us in James chapter 3, and we'll put those verses up there. But he talks about the difference between wisdom that is from above and wisdom from below. Wisdom that is from God and wisdom that is of this earth. Or wisdom that is fleshly or carnal. He says, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation of his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. In other words, church, we have to stop and take note. Remember, what what, what did Paul deal with first in the church? He dealt with division, envying, strife. That doesn't come from the wisdom of the cross. It comes from the wisdom of this world. And by the way, as Paul said, the wisdom of this world, it comes to naught. It comes to to nothing. Psalm 33 and verse 10, the psalmist said this, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. I'm going to tell you, the wisdom of the world will fail. But the wisdom of the cross... cannot be received by the unsaved world. They don't get it. They won't get it. They can't get it. So long as they are lost. They cannot. Did you notice what Paul said in verse number 8? Speaking of the cross, he said, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the world had known what they were doing, they wouldn't have done it. But they don't understand the wisdom of God. They don't understand the way of God. The wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of Christ, cannot be received by the unsaved world. It cannot be received by the carnal man. It cannot be received by the natural man. God's way won't make sense to this lost world around us. They won't understand why we do it, and they won't understand where we're going. Why do you raise your kids that way? That's weird. Why don't you let your kids watch? That's weird. Why Why do we go to church like we do? Why do we give like we do? Why do we forgive like we do? Why do we witness like we do? Buy boxes of donuts and put a gospel track on them. Why do we do those things? Still working it for Mr. Otley, all right? Still priming that donut pump. God's way won't make sense to this lost world. Don't expect it to. And by the way, we're going to look at it later. If you're looking for validation from the lost world around you, uh uh-uh. If you're looking for validation from what you find online, if you're looking for validation in the comments section, if you're looking for valid, I'm telling you, you're not going to find it because it doesn't make sense to the world. They can't understand. And by the way, when we walk in the flesh... Or we let our natural man be in charge? We don't understand either. They can't get it. But did you notice verse 10? They can't, verse 9. But verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. We can get it. The wisdom of the cross has been revealed to us. And by the way, the wisdom of the cross and the wisdom of Christ is available unto us as deep as we want to go. I love the end of that verse there. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 
You know what? We're not going to be fully grown until we get to glory. So that means I can always grow up a little more. That means I can always go a little deeper into the wisdom of the cross. The wisdom of the cross has been revealed unto us and it is available unto us as deep as we want to go. And by the way, if we take a step back and we take the emotion out of it and we take all the conversation around, uh, out of it, we really don't actually have to wonder too hard what the cross has to say about issues in our lives. We really don't have to wonder too hard about what the cross says about how we ought to treat our neighbor. We really don't have to wonder too hard about what the cross says about how we ought to treat our sin. We really don't have to wonder too hard about what the cross says about how we need to treat the person who's wronged us. We really don't have to wonder too hard about what the cross says about how we need to treat our spouse. We really don't need to wonder too hard about what the cross says about what, how we need to come to church. We really don't have to wonder too hard what the cross says, right? Oh, there's beauty in this simplicity. But the wisdom of the cross, not only does it declare a saving message, but it develops our spiritual maturity. Boy, sometimes we just need to grow up. Now I'm going to tell you, Paul's, in this book, Paul's going to, Paul's going to walk around right where you live quite a bit. Paul gets all up in our business under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So right now we're just setting the stage. Because next week he's going to talk about how carnal we are. And you know what? We can cross our arms and we can say, well, I'm not as bad as sister so-and-so. Or we can say, search me. Try me. Know me. Lead me. And we can ask the Holy Spirit of God to reveal the deep things of God to us and help us to grow up. Grow up. To grow up. Because here's the thing about God's way. God's way is good. Two people are with me. God's way is good. God's way is good. God's way is good. God's way is good, church. God's way is good, church. I know that, that we can scheme and we can plan. But when it comes to my scheme and it comes to God's will, God's will is good. And I know that my flesh has its propensities and it has the things that it wants. But when it comes to the desires of my flesh or the will of God, God's will is good. And I know sometimes it looks like a sacrifice. And I know sometimes it literally is taking up a cross. Dying to self. But God's way is good. It's kind of like this. You ever been to a church function? And you point at a dish and you say, who made that? And when you hear it was sister so-and-so, you go, oh. <laughs> Why? Because sister so-and-so's got a reputation. That everything she puts out, good stuff. I don't even necessarily need to know what it is. I just need to know who made it. Can I get a witness? I don't necessarily need to know all that's in it. I just need to know who made it. Because sister so-and-so, she only puts out good stuff. Can I tell you, we have a God who only puts out good stuff. I don't, I, don't, I don't always know what's in it. And I don't need to. Because I know who made it. I have not seen it, it says in verse 9. Nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of men the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. I'm going to tell you, that, that verse is specifically saying the lost world, it will not see and hear and it will not understand. But I'm going to tell you, when we choose... When we choose to heed the wisdom of the cross. When we allow the Spirit of God. To, I'm getting ahead of myself. 
But boy, I don't have to wonder if it's good because I know who made it. And here's the thing. You are as grown up in Christ as you have chosen to be. Because here's the thing about the wisdom of the cross. Number one, it declares a saving message. Hallelujah, there is no other. Number two, it develops our spiritual maturity. Here's the thing. To grow up in Christ, you don't need a Ph.D. You don't need a master's degree. You don't need to have memorized the first five books of the Bible and the last book. You don't need to. That's not a prerequisite. To, to grow up in Christ, we need to give ourselves every day to the wisdom of the cross. But here's the thing about the wisdom of the cross. Not only does it declare a saving message, not only does it develop our spiritual maturity, but the wisdom of the cross demands a surrendered man. The wisdom of the cross demands a surrendered man. Verse 12, Paul says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are, what's that next word? Freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The cross Declares a saving message. The cross develops our spiritual maturity, but the cross demands a surrendered man. There's a beauty in this simplicity. We have been given the Spirit. Amen? If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you are a born-again child of God this morning, the Spirit of God lives within you. We have been given the Spirit, and we have been given access to spiritual wisdom. Freely, the Bible says. Freely. Given to us of God. God wants us to know how to live. God wants us to grow up in Him. God wants us to be perfect and full and complete. Strong men and women of faith. God wants that for us. By the way, God wants that for us more than we want that for ourselves. He's given us the person of the Holy Ghost to teach us. John 14, verse 26, Jesus said this of the Holy Spirit, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Look what he says. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He's given us the person of the Holy Ghost to teach us. By the way, 1 John 3 reminds us of that truth as well. We have an unction. We have the Holy Ghost within us. We also have, Paul says, the process of comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So what do you think that means? The leading of the Holy Spirit, what do you think is the other spiritual thing we're comparing it with? Hmm. What could it be? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine. It teaches us what's right. For reproof, it teaches us what's wrong. For correction, it teaches us how to get right. For instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. Notice what it says, that the man of God may be, there's that word again, perfect. Not without error, but full grown, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Thy word, the psalmist said, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, comparing spiritual with spiritual, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, here's the problem. Far too many of us 
are trying to find wisdom comparing God's way with the natural way. You know, you can find somebody who will tell you what you want to hear. Who will tell you, oh, you're not bad for looking at what you look at. You're not bad for doing what you do. You're not bad for for holding on to that. You're not bad for... Sure, follow your heart. You do you. You know, you have to make it work for you. You can find, you can, you don't have to look hard or search far to find somebody who will tell you what you want to hear, but you won't find God's wisdom comparing spiritual things with the natural. We have to make a choice. You see, the Bible says, verse 14, did you catch it? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Paul here is not talking about so much the saved man and the lost man. He's not so much talking about the church and the unsaved world. He's setting the stage for the fact that in three verses, he's going to point the finger at him and say, your carnal babies in Christ grow up. You see, the problem is, is yeah, we, we, we receive the saving message, but when it, when it becomes to this spiritual maturity thing, well, we, we kind of just kind of end up hung up sometimes. Because the natural part of us still wants what the natural part wants. You know, Paul said, who shall save, oh wretched man that I am, who shall save me? By the way, if Paul still had that struggle, you still have that struggle. Yes, you. And we have to make the choice. Because the natural man does not, yea, it cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. You will never make God's word make sense from an earthly perspective. You never will. You never will. You'll never make coming to church, serving in the church, Tithing to the kingdom of God. You'll never make it make sense from an earthly perspective. Witnessing to your friends and to your family. You'll never make it make sense from an earthly perspective. There will always be an out. I, I, I think about in our day and age, boy, we've got we've to fight to stay pure, don't we? You know, the, the biblical sexual ethic still hasn't changed. The, the bed is honorable in marriage, Period. Not outside of it in any shape, form, or fashion. But you will never make God's word make sense from an earthly perspective. And we don't filter the wisdom of the cross through Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. We don't filter the wisdom of the cross through an unsaved secular counselor. Or even some so-called Christian counselors. Or even some so-called pastors. You will never make God's word make sense from an earthly perspective. But the spiritual man, the one who compares spiritual things with spiritual. Did you see it in verse 15? But he that is spiritual judgeth. That word means discerns, comprehends, judges all things. What does all mean? All. All. That means the spiritual man, the one who is led of the Spirit, the one who who gives himself, taught of the Spirit, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. He is able to discern, to understand all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. In other words, this lost world, or even backslidden Christians, or even well-meaning Christians who are right with the Lord, don't get to tell me how to live apart from God's word. Why? Did you see verse 16? 
because we have the mind of Christ. It demands a surrendered man. A surrendered man. I saw this quote this week. It was attributed to Elizabeth Elliot. It simply says, much of what we call struggling in life is really just delayed obedience. That one hits close to home, don't it? Much of what we call struggling in life is really just delayed obedience. You see, the struggle isn't so much around us, it's within us. And we, the church of the living God, have to make the choice to surrender to the mind of Christ. We have to make the choice to be schooled by the Holy Spirit. We're not here to teach Him, He's here to teach us. We have to make the choice to hold Scripture as our final authority. No, yeah, buts. Or no, I know that, but. Or no, one day we will. No, we have to make the choice to hold the scripture as our final authority. We have to make the choice to die to the natural man every day. Because we cannot walk in the wisdom of the cross. And in the wisdom of this world. You know, the world needs the church. But I think we're quick to forget how much the church needs the Lord. Aren't power outages the worst? Just the worst. Especially when they're over a long amount of time. And i got to worry about that sump pump in the basement that's not working anymore. And all that stuff. Luckily the kids are getting older. So next time I'm just going to send the boy down with a bucket. So it's going to be great. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. And when he grows up and moves away, the other boy will be old enough to carry a bucket down to the basement. I'm good until I'm like 60. So, uh, oh, amen. Amen and amen and amen. You know, we get frustrated by power outages in the physical realm, but I, it saddens me how many churches have existed with power outages for years and we don't seem bothered by it. I'm talking about spiritual power outage. I'm talking about the lights are on, but nothing's happening. I'm talking about the Lord is standing at the door and knocking, but nobody is answering. I'm talking about the wisdom of the cross and the wisdom of Christ is available. It is freely given, yet no one is heeding. So many are comfortable living the Christian life in our own ability. We get comfortable making Jesus work for us. But the cross is still the answer. It's still the answer for the lost world. It's still the answer for the church of God. The cross is still the answer. And before we get into all these other things, hear me. It doesn't matter what the problem is. You cannot be a cross-centered church and a cross-centered Christian and still be a clicky church or Christian. You can't be a cross-centered church or Christian and be a carnal Christian or a critical Christian or a self-centered Christian. There is a wisdom and a power cross that is still the answer for the lost and saved alike church it's still the cross would you stand together this morning